of Team Lotus Boxer 2019 SCG Tour Playa of the Year against Jamerson Purdue, who lost playing for the 9-0 yesterday to Peter Ingram, but his tournament is still going totally fine. Both these players 10-2, still very much in top eight contention, and perhaps Patrick will see both later today. And I would say that Mono White Devotion, though not the most represented deck on, on day number two, that one goes very easily to Demir Inverter. Uh, to me, one of the, kind of the surprising breakout performances of this tournament, the fourth most represented deck in day number two after Inverter, Soul Tide Delirium, and Bant Spirits. I believe Jameson has been at the top of the field among people playing this archetype, was 8-0 yesterday and lost an on-camera feature match and has had a very good day number two thus far and sits at 10 and 2, very close to a top 8 berth himself. Yeah, you mentioned that metagame breakdown and how things did look here on day number 2 of competition. We know that Demir Inverter is the most played deck by a lot. You see these players are going to roll Zan running good, rolls himself a nice little 6, so Azoria Spirits will be on the play. Azoria Spirits, though, not a lot of representation. Just Zan and Jeremy Bertarioni. Jeremy Bertarioni at 10 and 3 right now. Yeah. Oh, sorry, excuse me, 9-3. and three. And we got one mysterious other person playing the deck. Three players in day number two, but two of them are members of Team Lotus Box. You see Demir Inverter with 16 copies. Salt Idol Dream with 15. Bant Spirits at 9. Mono White Devotion. Jamison Purdue is one of those six. 8.7% of the day two metagame. Lotus Breach disappointing here in Indianapolis. Perhaps that weekend in Phoenix was its breakout performance because it looks like a lot of players have figured out how to beat that strategy. It has not looked good on camera, nor has made up very much of the day two field. A lot more damping spheres just across people's sideboards. Much better preparation than we've, saw, we've seen in previous weeks. Purdue on a mulligan of six, so he will take a look, of course, at seven cards and ideally put one back instead of having to mulligan once again. And though he does not look thrilled with his opening hand. But he will put one on the bottom, so he'll keep those six cards. These players will be given the green light by our wonderful table spotter. And we'll see who will begin things. It's going to be Jameson Purdue with an idyllic range. So we're going to head back over to Zan. Zan will play a copy of Port Town. Believe it or not, it's untapped, my friend. Mausoleum Wanderer, and mm. away we go. Trust me, I can't believe it either. Achievement unlocked. Castle Ardenvale is land number two here for Jameson. This is going to be, I, I mean, this matchup is really going to test Purdue's ability to interact. He does not have a lot of flying creatures. He does not have a lot of removal. And Spirits is typically pretty ruthless against strategies that aren't able to either load up on removal or find some way to block in the air. Walking Ballista taking care of that Mausoleum Wanderer. We're going to head back over to Zan. Again, the 2019 SCG Tour Player of the Year who made a deep run at the Players' Championship last year. Going up against Jameson Purdue in that Mono White Devotion deck. Another copy of Walking Ballista. Good on its own, but also part of a combo alongside Heliod Sun Crown, which I'm sure has come up at least once or twice for Purdue. As Brazen Borrower, more importantly, the Petty Theft portion of that card is going to bounce that walking ballista. Yeah, there's two ways that walking ballista plays in this deck, and uh, it's uh, emblematic. There are not a lot of four ofs in this list. Walking ballista is one of them. Obviously, the combo with Heliod gets top billing. It's also the most powerful thing for this deck to be doing with Nykthos, and many of the cards that's playing for two and three mana have two or three mana symbols. Uh, the deck is not really long on a bunch of X spells. It's not like green devotion list where you have a lot of ways to dump mana. Walking Ballista is really the premier thing. Teferi's here. It's going to go up to five. And we got a who's who here in Arcanist out. Going to take a look at the top handful of cards. Now will Jameson Purdue. And it looks like he's found a copy of Baffling End. Only two copies of Arcanist Owl in Purdue's list. I know some players have opted to play three or even four copies of this card, as it does help find either piece of the combo in Heliod and Walking Ballista, and also provides plenty of devotion alongside Nykthos. Teferi's going to move its way up to six. Xan will play a Plains. And Xan will simply pass the turn back over to Jameson Purdue, it looks like. So Jameson's going to untap those four lands. He'll draw a card as we move on to his fifth turn of the game. Remember... He's on a mulligan to six here, but it looks to be going just fine. It's here comes the Owl to try 
and work on that Teferi, but Brazen Borrow is going to be flashed in, and it will trade with the Owl as it can block flying creatures. I think that's a really sharp trade there for, for Zan, that Brazen Borrower would be challenging to leverage against an opposing Walking Ballista, which he already knows about. Purdue doesn't want to try to do anything pre-combat because that's asking to run into a Spell Queller. So the First Order business is moving to combat, and then Zan will play the Brazen Borrower there, get the trade with a one toughness creature. This looks like a Ballista for two, a card that is great against all types of spirit stacks. Here is, very quickly, a Spectral Sailor. To ferry the draw here for Xan. Looks like Xan is struggling this game, though. A lot of one toughness creatures. The difference in this matchup, too, of course, is that no collected company for Xan to play on the end step because he is a Zorius. Does not have that green splash to make his deck a Bant version of his spirit strategy. Yeah, the mana base is a lot cleaner. He saves himself a lot of damage by not having a bunch of breeding pools. And you get Mute Vault as well. The downside, as you mentioned, Collective Company, very powerful in this sort of deck, and that is off the table. And you did mention Mute Vault, and of course that card is worth mentioning because it is incredibly powerful. One of Pioneer's most powerful cards is Xan is going to play a Hollow Fountain untapped. He'll just pass the turn back for now as Teferi is at seven for Saeed. So back to Purdue, we're going to go. Got a couple of lands out there on the battlefield. That Ballista on two, and now a copy of Knight of the White Orchid to help him get a land out of his deck, perhaps. And it looks like that's going to resolve. So let's go find ourselves a plane, shall we? taking a long look before deciding what land he's going to grab here. And there is another copy of Idyllic Green. Combo alert, combo alert, woo, woo. When it enters the battlefield, <laughs> it enters the battlefield tapped unless you control three or more <laughs> other planes. When Idyllic Green enters the battlefield untapped, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. So you mentioned a combo alert, woo, woo. Yeah. There are some cute interactions with that card. Spectral Sailor down. And now Walking Ballista will be bounced. That's Petty Theft. It's causing Purdue to pick that up. But these kind of exchanges are not particularly good for Xan right now yeah. when it comes to interacting with Walking Ballista. Now here is a Banalish Marshal. Ballista is just a problematic card. Once it's on the battlefield, it's a sink for mana in spots where you don't want to be casting spells. A lot of Xan's creatures are fragile. And so it's just going to require a lot of bobbing and weaving, as we've seen so far from Xan, to, to manage this. Teferi's going to minus. It's going to bounce Banalish Marshall. So a new card coming here for Xan. Xan is, I think, very much on the hunt for a spell queller. Yeah, that would be the big hit here. But for now, he's going to turn towards Empyrean Eagle. And now get in here in the air with that Brazen Borrower. Port Town on the battlefield tapped, and we're going to head back over to Jamison Purdue as he begins his turn at 15. Eagle here very good, both for increasing that clock and giving a little bit more durability to Zan's fragile flyers in the face of Walking Ballista. Baffling N, a card that Purdue did find off this copy of Arcanist Owl, will be placed onto the stack. Going to go after the Imperial Eagle, and that'll work just fine. Baffling And now here comes the Knight. Going to do a little bit of work on Old Teferi, perhaps. This is a Spectral Sailor that wants to block the Knight of the White Orchid. There you do see Baffling End. There's the battlefield. Exile target creature and opponent controls that convert a mana cost three or less. When Baffling End leaves the battlefield, target opponent creates a 3-3 green dinosaur creature token with trample. So, worth noting that Baffling End takes care of the creature for good, even if it does get destroyed. 
It's kind of weird. We've, we've seen a lot of Oblivion Ring style effects where you unlock it, and that one's different. Gone forever, but if you do something about it, you get a 3-3. Three, three. Heliod Suncrowned. Kindly leave. We head back to Zan after that bounce with the Teferi to play another Eagle. Brazen Borrower is going to come across for four more. Purdue is going to fall down to 11. Really interesting game here from Zan. You know, you can see the sort of trying to bob and weave, trying to keep Purdue's hand glutted with cards that he can't leverage, trying to get in shots with flyers where he can. The, the burden is on Purdue. I, I think to break this game open, he really needs to start playing two spells in a turn. That's, good. That's the way to prevent any of this from happening. His hand's substantially more powerful than Zan, and Zan's running out of cards anyway. If you can get to a spot where he can get the Ballista down with a lot of mana and no response from Zan, that's probably going to wrap this game up, especially given that he's got four or other, five other spells in hand to work with. There is another copy of Heliot Suncrown, and that is active now, by the way, as there are five devotion on the battlefield. Heliot itself... Each baffling end will provide one each, so that will bring you up to three, and none of the wor white orchid, excuse me, will be four and five devotion to fairy. says, Heliod, please go away. And now here come the knuckleheads in the air. Purdue is down to six, playing a very dangerous game here. Got to get a walking ballista established, I think. Now the white orchid is going to take care of Teferi. There is a plains. This is a walking ballista on three. And this was kind of the magic number that I believe Purdue was waiting to get to. Mm -hmm. As this also does a great job of playing around Spell Queller, of course, as the converted mana cost there is a little outside of Spell Queller's range. So, I'm going to start by shooting down the Selfless Spirit. Zan is going, to is going to respond by sacrificing that to try to protect the Brazen Borrower, and that will not work. Brazen Borrower will die too. So... Zan will have to draw now, and this has been the big question kind of looming over this entire game as he's tried and tried to delay the inevitable, and that's walking Blista gunning down his creatures. Well, now we're also just reaching the point where, you know, Purdue might be able to leverage the combo to wrap this game up and not risk being punked up on any flash creatures on Saeed's side. Zan is going to go to Mausoleum Wanderer. And he'll just have to pass the turn back. So not the most impressive of plays from the 2019 SCG Tour Player of the Year as he tries to catch back up and cross the finish line in this game. But I think, I think this game has very much swung in favor of Jamison Purdue. He'll deploy Heliod now. That is a spell queller to take care of the Heliod. So that's somewhat timely, I believe. Let's see what the follow-up is here. It'll be a Plains. You see that he does have a copy of Thraven Inspector in hand, and we already know about the Manalish Marshal as well. So this looks to be a Stasis Snare. It's a big one here. Stasis Snare is going to enter the battlefield. It's going to take care of the Spell Queller, which means the Heliod will be unlocked. So Purdue takes care of that problem. And now Knight of the White Orchid looks like it's going to truck on in for a couple points of damage. And this makes it so much less likely that Purdue just gets killed by a flurry of lords the next turn, and the combo is set up for next turn. Thraven Inspector of the play, a clue will be coming Jameson Purdue's way. As Zan is going to draw a card here, a Mausoleum Wanderer is feeling it for one point of damage. Purdue's going to fall down to five, but five is not zero, partner. And I think in just a moment we, say we may see Jameson Purdue wrap this up with the powerful combo of Heliod Suncrown and Walking Ballista. But first, he'll deploy Banalish Marshall. Now he'll give this lifelink. It's a 2-2 two -two after all. And even if, if Zan has a trick to break up the combo, you can just use Heliod on something big, mm -hmm. gain a bunch of life, and play on from there. Or, of course, activate Heliod again in response right, with the two on the Walking Ballista and then gun him down because it'll 
Remove a counter to deal a damage, and then because it does have lifelink, it will get a plus one, plus one counter again. Rinse, repeat. That's infinite damage, folks, and that's a game one win for Jamison Purdue over Zan Saeed. Mono White Devotion up a game here over Azoria Spirits as we now turn our attention to the sideboards. Zan down a game in what might be a pretty difficult matchup. We'll see that he does have three copies of Declaration in Stone, two Cerulean Drakes. That one's for the Mono Red matchup. Two Dampening Spheres. That one's for Lotus Breach. Two Gideon the Trials. That one is for, of course... Demir Inverter. Two Disdainful Stroke, two Rest in Peace, and two Detention Sphere. Not a ton of great cards here, but there is some removal to bring in if you'd like. I, I suppose so. The Declaration of Stones here are probably fine. Um, past that, I mean, Detention Sphere also okay for a deck that puts a lot of permanence on the battlefield. Probably just those removal spells. The rest of this is for different matchups, and I don't think, you know, Gideon the Trials, you can't really defend very effectively. I think it's a very narrow card for the Inverter matchup, not something that just comes in broadly in matchups that go a little bit longer. Jamison Purdue's got three Rest in Peace, three Dampening Spheres, two Elspeth Conquers Death, two Baffling End, two Stasis Snare, two Glare of Heresy, and a Gideon ally of Zendikar. I want the extra copies of Baffling End and the extra copies of Stasis Snare. Just very effective removal in this kind of matchup. Not a ton to bring in, though. Really no. for either player. Well, you know, I, I mean, this is kind of a, a fringier deck. And also, uh, a deck like Blue-White only has so many types of... A uh, Blue-White creature deck only has so many types of cards they can really bring in against another creature deck. Because normally what you see in that kind of slot is a sweeper, but so you can't really play with cards like Supreme Verdict. On the other side of this, uh, not a lot that a mono-white deck can really do to adjust against a sea of flyers, except bring in a couple of the removal spells. Also, Purdue's deck in general can't sideboard out that much because it is a combo deck. All the cards kind of add to devotion and are pieces of the engine in their own way. And so you see a sideboard that's much more about a handful of cards for each matchup rather than trying to bring eight or nine in for any given matchup. Those are the options there for both players. Game number two is going to be underway here in just a moment as they shuffle up and get ready for that second game. We want to let you know where the SCD Tour is going to be through Season 1. That'll take you through June. We kick things off in Columbus at Team Modern Open 1 by Danny Jessup. Harlan Fear and Zach Allen, that was their first of two wins through our first four opens. We'll get to that second one in just a moment. But Knoxville won by Aaron Barrage, her third SCG Tour Open win, that time with Golgari Yogmoth. Richmond won by Corey Baumeister, Peter Ingram, who we already mentioned many times here this weekend. He's in first place right now. And Ely Cassis. And then that second open that Jessup, Fear, and Allen won, well, that was in SCG Philadelphia just a couple of weeks ago. We're here in Indy, and then... Right around the corner, a little modern action for those regional championships. Yeah, and you can have a go to games.com slash regionals to find more information. All the information for regionals is up on the website, including the venues. So make sure to find the regional championship closest to you. And again, that's modern and March the 7th at go to regional starcygames.com slash regionals. After that, we head to Baltimore and Syracuse for Pioneer and Modern Opens. That takes us to April, where we'll be in Atlanta. And then at the end of the month, we'll be heading to Worcester. Past that, we'll be in May. Modern, a Modern Open in Cincinnati, a Team Pioneer Open in Louisville, and then a Pioneer Open in Philadelphia. And to round out Season 1, SCG Con Summer featuring the Star City Games Invitational. That's June 11th through the 14th, Berkland Center in Roanoke, Virginia. Go to starcitygames.com slash schedule for more information. As we get ready here for game number two between Purdue and Saeed, we'll have a time-shifted match to bring you here as well. As Mausoleum Wanderer off of Port Town is how Zan's going to start off this game. This is a Thraven Inspector from Jameson Purdue, one of the best white creatures of all time. Going to bring a clue alongside with it, will the one, two, as we head back over to Zan. And Zan will play another copy of Port Town, reveal that same island, get across here for one point of damage. And pass the turn back, will Zan, over to Jameson. So Jameson will draw. You see, he's already got planes in his hand, picked up a copy of Dakthos. So, in for one, the follow-up is that Daxos. And we are going back over to Zan, who will very quickly play a Spectral Sailor on tap and draw. Picked up a copy of Selfless Spirit, did Zan. So now this will be an Empyrean Eagle, and that is going to make it so. Zan is attacking for five points of damage this turn. Purdue already down to 14. And this is... Zan's preferred strategy in the matchup is just turn it into a pure damage race where Purdue doesn't have very much removal and not a whole lot of ways to block. Now the White Orchid's going to come down, check the lands. Jameson's got two, Zan's got three, so this will be a freebie. There is a basic plane, so that's going to enter the battlefield untapped. And we'll see if 
Purdue has a land and maybe something like a baffling end. Be a great turn for catching up. Some presence on the battlefield and a removal spell for a problematic creature. Remember, Mausoleum Wanderer, great at countering instants and sorceries, but not enchantments, and so there is the baffling end. And now here come the beatdowns with Daxos and Thraven Inspector. We're going to head back Zan's way now. Remember as well, the Daxos does have that text that when another creature you control enters the battlefield or dies, you gain a life. So while we are in a racing situation, this is one that may favor Jameson Purdue, given the little bit of life gain he can do maybe every turn. Yep. Every spell that he has is removal, and every creature that he has is life for Daxos. Let's gain a life, and how about a little bit of removal here and walking Ballista on two. Oh, boy. Meow, meow, meow. Oh, combo alert. Combo. <laughs> <laughs> Idyllic Grange is going to put a counter there on the walking Ballista. Selfless Spear is a great place to start. The follow-up here for Xan is going to be a r r r rattle chains to protect the Selfless Spirit. Now we'll see how Purdue wants to respond. Purdue says, you know what? I'm going to go after your Selfless Spirit again, please and thank you. And Xan is going to sacrifice that Selfless Spirit. So... We're going to see it looks like no response. And now here come the knuckleheads, perhaps. Now, you got to remember that that rattle chains is not indestructible, depending on how Jamerson Purdue did play his turn. Yeah, Purdue responded to the cast, and the rattle chains was not on the battlefield when Selfless Spirit's trigger resolved. And based on Zan not blocking there, it looks like Purdue was able to do that. Walking Ballista is one card that Zan does not want to play against this weekend, and he is... Seeing a whole bunch of it this round. Mm -hmm. And Purdue drawing pretty much everything in the deck at this point is good. Mana, especially Nykthos, is just a lot of fuel for Walking Ballista. Creatures help race and play alongside Daxos. The removal spells can pick, a pick apart any Lord that makes things more complicated for Purdue. So very strong position. A lot of life to work with here. That 13 falling to 9 from this attack. Empyrean Eagle which can be played as an instant because of the rattle chains. Is really Zan's best shot. And it looks like rattle chains is going to bite the dust from the walking ballista. So the eagle's going to pop up the jam. It's going to be an attack for five. I think that was Zan's last card in hand. Yep. Purdue also gets one life for his trouble there from the Daxos trigger. Very true. And Offenza, Kin Tree Spirit will now join the fray. The follow-up is a Stasis Snare. That will take care of the Imperial Eagle. Here come the attacks. It'll be two, four, five on the ground that Purdue will rumble along with, bringing himself up a little bit of life in the process. He'll play his last land and simply pass the turn back. So both these players are empty-handed until Zan just drew that card. And I don't know what the best draw is here for Zan, but it's got to be a pretty darn good one. And Purdue has been using his mana so efficiently, has not had time to even touch that clue from the first turn. And this is just not a position that Zan's deck plays all that well from. Spirit's a deck that really likes to play from ahead. Small utility creatures, especially ones that are capable of gaining life, a problematic to race, and it's just been the, the right blend of removal for the big stuff, enough haymakers that have prompted awkward responses, specifically walking ballista, and enough pressure to shrink the length of the game, you know, that Zan has not had the window, for example, to activate Spectral Sailor. He's had to use his mana every single turn, just trying to keep his battlefield presence tolerable. And so he is out of resources to work with, very far behind in the damage race. Detention Sphere is going to take care of the Stasis Snare, which unlocks the Empyrean Eagle. Which it means that these creatures have all gotten a little bit bigger. can be another attack for five. Can't do a whole lot better than that. And you have a hope here, if you're in Zan's position, that if the next two draws are lands for Purdue, because he has his draw step plus his clue, this attack for four, you survive the next turn, and then you have six coming across the next turn. Now, how much does Zan want to attack with here? Because if he attacks right now, it would be an attack here for five. Mausoleum Wander will come across for three. Spectral Spirit, Spectral Sailor, pardon me, will come across for two. That could knock Purdue down to five. 
Yeah, I suppose you have, uh, in theory, you have three this turn and then seven the next turn. So you can leave the Spectral Sailor back as a blocker for the Thraven Inspector. But also, if you are on Exaxes for lethal, then you can't allow anything on Produce side to die either, because then the Daxos trigger happens and you're off. Yeah, Daxos, whenever a creature enters the battlefield or dies, Purdue would gain a life. And in fact, I think that Castle Ardenvale off the top is enough to really muck up the combat. Yeah, oddly, that one gaining a life. Just one. Yep. Is really all it takes in this situation. So Zan's got to figure out if there's a good block to be had here. Remember that Empyrean Eagle is a 2 3. That's that gold creature on the side of the battlefield there for Zan. I kind of wish that Purtue had sandbagged the Castle Arden Vale. Yeah. Because, uh, I, I checked to see does to is there something to be done? Is the reason to play that pre combat anything to do with Anafensa? But Anafensa only triggers off of, off of non tokens. Giving. Zan, the information that you're about to go to eight really changes what his blocks look like. Because before he might have gone out of his way to not kill the Thraben Inspector because going up to eight again uh, is enough on the table for Purdue to win the following turn. Now that Zan knows that his attacks are no good face up next turn, he knows ahead of time that he has to block assuming that he needs help. He needs a lord off the top or whatever. Well, interesting here. You've got Spectral Sailor as a 2-2 getting in front of the Thraven Inspector. You've got Imperian Eagle, excuse me, as a 2-3 getting in front of Anafensa, which is a 2-2. So that means that Xan would kill two creatures in combat. Purdue would gain two life and go up to nine, potentially ten with the Castle Ardenvale. And then Purdue would also get four points of damage through and Xan would fall down to two, but Xan would still be alive. Because theoretically another block that's available to Xan is the Eagle goes in front of Daxos and I just take five. Mm -hmm. Nothing dies, and if you brick your other draw, now you're dead. But now he knows that's no good. Well, Purdue is going to simply pass the turn back. He's at nine, Xan's at two. So let's see, two, three, four, five, six. Xan's got six that he can attack with right now. Zan's going to draw a card with the Spectral Sailor. Can Saeed figure yeah. out a way to cross the finish line? Land plus, su plus Supreme Phantom, I think, is the, yeah, the two-card combo that can get it done from here. That would be a winning combination. Ideally, the land is not Hollowed Fountain. No. Or Old Port, Port Town. Town. Old Stinky Port Town. And now Zan's got to analyze the battlefield again and see, is there a way, as he plays a glacial fortress, is there a way to walk the tightrope here and still win this game? It looks like Mausoleum Wanderer is thinking about getting busy in the red zone. It'll be an attack for two in the air. Purdue's going to fall down to seven. Zan's follow-up is Declaration in Stone. It's a big one. Purdue's going to respond by making a 1-1, one -one, which means he's going to gain a life, and now the Daxos is exiled. A clue coming here for Purdue, which means he'll get to see not one, but two cards on his next turn, if he'd like. One for the draw step, one from the clue. And we'll get him a 1-1 one -one human from that Castle Ardenvale. There's Shaheen Sarani. So now it's time for Purdue to untap. There are a lot of big draws here that just flat win him the game. Walking Ballista is certainly one of them. But Alish Marshall wouldn't be bad either. So he'll draw a card from that clue. Looks like Knight of the White Orchid in hand now. But Purdue has really no way to force the issue on the table. He's got two. He's got a two-two. I guess a bunch uh, and a one-one against a two-two and a two-three. Well. Zan's got outs. He can win the game this turn, folks. He just needs to draw himself one of those lords. Right now, six power on the battlefield. He's going to activate the Spectral Sailor, it looks like, as he taps four mana once again. Thinking about what he can draw in this situation. Lord being the best of the bunch, so he will draw a card. Supreme Phantom, are you there? That does not appear to be the case, but Petty Theft is. And now you have to wonder how Petty Theft works itself into the equation here. Well, it makes it really appealing for Zan to sort of leave himself dead on the table. Mm -hmm. If you can make an attack here that incense Purdue to just send everything in, 
you might be able to blow the game wide open with petty theft. Yeah, you got to be careful. Right, it's this tightrope, right? Because you want to send enough where it looks good for Purdue to go for it, but not making it way too... I guess Purdue probably doesn't... His hand's kind of forced because he can't block, so he's mm -hmm. just going to be sending it anyway. Zan is... Oh, he drew Declaration in Stone as oh, well. That's going to change some okay. things. That's going to be three clues here for Zan. Now the attacking's got a whole bunch easier. Yeah, I mean, he's still, uh, in theory, Banalish Marshall plus a way to remove a blocker is lethal. So you could just try to send in... I like, I, I like sending in the 2-2s two because the 2-3 back on defense makes it pretty challenging for Banalish Marshall to matter. Although I suppose you're still dead to removal plus one. So you just send in one attacker, try to prevent as much as you can the possibility of getting killed next turn by some running draws off these clues, and then send in lethal next turn. Walkie B, where are you? Walkie B is still lethal right now. Yep. Looks like an anaphensa to me. And remember, Jameson has not played a land just yet. He did draw a copy of an Alish Marshall, so he does have, have he does have that in his hand right now. But Marshall doesn't really get him anywhere. Nope. It's just now you have a two-two against a two-three. Still two more clues to sacrifice, and Purdue has not played a land yet this turn. So what do you think? You go one deeper, try to find Walkie B. I mean, you are. Right now, if you're in Purdue's position, you are dead on the table, and you have very little in your deck to like manage a damage race from here. With two blockers back on defense from Zayed's side, you don't even have the possibility of Banalish Marshall into Declaration in Stone and now attack with the 2-2. You've just got to find Walking Ballista this turn. Uh, I don't think he found it, folks. A couple of additional draw steps thanks to Declaration in Stone. But you see that he's found multiple copies of Banalish Marshall. Looks like an Anafenza and a Plains in hand. Get him! Get him, Shaheen. Great block. Love that block. The follow-up. Sack the clue. Yep. No good. Zan Said is going to steal that second game. We are all tied up between Azoria Spirits and Mono White Devotion. That was really impressive stuff there. It was interesting going back several, several turns ago where Purdue got rid of the walking ballista to just manage the damage reach because his position looks so commanding even without the Ballista that the one thing he wanted to do is avoid taking a huge shot the turn that Zaid flashed in the Lord. And Zaid, in spite of having just some 1-1 flyers, able to bob and weave very effectively there. Uh, great job managing that damage race and was able to barely cross uh, the finish line there before Purdue's extra resources overwhelmed him. Game three going to be underway here between Zan and Jamison in just a moment. Jamison will be on the play as well for this third and final game. Remember, winner of this match is one step closer to making our top eight, which is exactly where both these players want to be. In the meantime, Patrick, talk to him. So... All of you people who harassed me online, now I'm monetizing it. Send your questions over to mailbag at starcitygames.com. Any question that you have, treat it as sort of a perpetual AMA, and you might have your question answered in Sullivan Satchel. Additionally, my DMs at Basic Mountain, for the time being, are open. So if you, it is easier for you to reach out to me there, feel free to do so. And you had to have a premium subscription to read it, too. Don't forget about that. $7.99 over at starcygames.com. Plenty of discounts across the website. So get some knowledge. Get some discounts. Let's get this thing rolling. We're, we're running downhill. Just slide right in. We're running right down. We're running downhill. You slide on into those DMs. I know you have questions. It's not theoretical because, like, you know, you send them to me anyway. Solvent Satchel. Starcygames.com. You know who doesn't have a mailbag? I don't. Zan. To our, he to, doesn't, to, have, to, to my he doesn't have a satchel uh -huh. like you do. 28-year-old from Atlanta, Georgia. Last year, 22 opens played. Eight open top eights with one W. That was in Syracuse. All time, 14 open top eights. Two wins. Invitational top eights and wins have eluded him. But he was our 2019 SCG Tour Player of the Year, and he topped forward the 2019 Players Championship. He loves himself some new food in some new cities. As long as they are rated 4.5 or higher, on Yelp. I'll give a 5.0 to Steak and Shake <laughs> down in Indianapolis. That is a really misleading Highest rating. statement. No. No, no, no. That was a great game number two from Zan. 
a great, it was. great game. Yeah. Couldn't argue otherwise. Very well played. Really good back and forth between the two of them, but. And I don't even know if Purdue's play with that walking ballistic in game number two was a mistake. I think it's very close. But it says a lot about the resilience of this deck and Zan's comfort level navigating it that Purdue, I believe, pulled the trigger on that ballista because he thought, I can only lose this game to getting punked out by some weird sequence of lords. If I just keep my life total high, I've got Daxos running. There's really no way for Zan to win this damage race with the resources that he had. And with some really crafty play, some real skill navigating the damage race, Zan was able to do it. But this is where it gets tough. Yes. On the draw against a deck that can be pretty aggressive at times, has removal, and has a combo built in, and oh, by the way, four copies of Walking Ballista. Yeah, the tough part here is that Purdue forces you to play the game short and long. He can just curve out and start attacking you and gain life and you know maybe get, land something like Heliod and manage the damage race that way. And with cards like Walking Ballista, the combo, potentially Planeswalkers, his removal, he can play a deep game as well. Zayzek is much the same. I mean, there, there are tools to play a short game and tools to play a long game. But on the draw, down a card, and really a, a deck that's not super well equipped to block, this is going to be a challenging one. Well, these players will be given the green light here in just a moment as Zan is taking a long look at this opening hand. Again, such a crucial match right here for both of these players, sitting at 10-2. Three rounds left in the Swiss. This is, of course, round number 13 of 15. Zan going to put that top card to the bottom. You win this one, you're up to 11-2. and two, And then you are one win away from making the elimination rounds of a very large open here. 801 players in our main event. A plains and an island here for each player. And now Jameson will be the first to the battlefield with a Daxos. Zan with no Spectral Sailor, so he'll just draw a card. Picked up a copy of Supreme Phantom. And will he deploy the 1-3 flyer or not? And it looks like I'm about to have my question answered. The answer is yes. You know what is something Purdue's deck has struggled with so far? Three toughness. Three toughness has been a bad number. It's been a little tough. <laughs> here is a baffling end to take care of the Supreme Phantom, but no third land drop here for Jameson Purdue, which has got to be good news for Zan because that means the walking blisses are going to be rather small if they show up at all. Nah, Purdue trying to get fancy with his Knight of the White Orchid. Mm. Tails all the time. That might get spell quellered. What up? How? Mm. How? Mm. There's a Plains for Jameson Purdue post Knight of the White Orchid. So we head back over to Zan. The Zan's going to come in here for two. 18-16 in favor of Purdue, as Saeed will just pass the turn back. Glare of Heresy right now in Purdue's hand. We might have to take a look at that in just a moment. But first, Daxos is going to come in here for two. That exile is a white permanent for two mana at sorcery speed. Look at you. Knight of the White Orchid. Is this one? Um, Are you expecting another spell queller, my friend? Or Zan just doesn't care. Okay. Because they have the same number of lands. That is a very good point. As Jameson went reaching for his deck. And now here's a Rattle Chains. Now, Daxos will trigger and gain a life, assuming that Jameson did remember. So now we head back Zan's way. Very good point there. Zan just does not care about that Knight of the White Orchid. No, I think who Jameson would? <laughs> just assumed <laughs> right. that he was going to get a land there. I already stone ran myself to do this. It must mm -hmm. still be good. Nope. Rattle Chain's going to come in, too. Bit of a string attack there, but we're yeah. all good. <laughs> Classic Florida draft draft play. Been a long time since I've heard a good string attack reference. Glare of heresy. Dude, I, I know them all. How? String attack. Declaration of stone. Declaration of stone. Baffling end. Okay. 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 That'll break Big the chain. turn. Big turn. So, baffling end will take care of the spell queller. That'll unleash the glare of heresy. Glare of heresy is going to take care of the other spell queller, which means that Knight of the White Orchid is going to come back, not search for a land, and now here come the beatdowns. So, Exile target white permanent has worked out just fine here for Jameson Purdue. Yeah, one of the best ways to mitigate Spell Queller, two cheap removal spells in the same turn, and all the dominoes collapse. So now things have gotten tough here for Zan. He's going to come across with a rattle chain, see if he can keep up. Remember, Zan's been missing some land drops here, and now he's a 10 life. Zan's just going to pass the turn back with something at the ready, not quite sure what it is, but we will go over to Jameson Purdue, who's going to give some beatdowns, and this is an Imperial Eagle. 
at instant speed. 2-3. Looking to block a 2-2. So I think Jamison's draw step this time was walking ballista. That attack might have been hard before, but I don't think he cares about uh, a flash creature here if the consolation prize is kill your lord and keep the ballista around. Well, that strikes me as a pretty good turn. So there is ballista for two. Imperial and Eagle down. Can kill rattle chains whenever he'd like. Oh, and by the way, gaining a little bit of life along the way thanks to the Daxos. Zan down to six. It's looking bad for your 2019 SCG Tour Player of the Year. He'll go to Supreme Phantom. That'll buff the Rattle Chains. Let's see if Jamison will let this resolve. I mean, it's very risky to go for it here if uh, another Rattle Chains or Lord were to drop off mm -hmm. and you use the Ballista here. Suddenly, the race has swung very far back into Zayed's favor. Does Purdue make a move with that ballista? Or does he hold it and start using the mana he has available? It looks like he will not make a move, and Zan will not make an attack. So we're going to head back Jameson's way. This is another copy of Baffling End. Is there another rattle chains here for Zan? All other things being equal, I would really like to try to avoid using the walking ballista for modest purposes if the game is close at all because that is the card that if you draw nykthos it's over on the spot mm -hmm. it's just way 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 too much here comes daxos here comes knight of the white orchid and this zan is reaching for mana might be a copy of perhaps petty theft it'll be a supreme phantom at instant speed Ooh, zan getting a little tricky tricky will there be a response No, I mean, this might be, you know, you, the Rattle Chain still doesn't have a good block here mm -hmm. because of first strike and then just a ton of toughness. If, you, if Zan wants to put the Supreme Verdict in front of something, it doesn't eat the attacker, and Purdue still has the option to finish off the lore with Walking Ballista should he want to go that way. So Supreme Phantom is going to block the Knight of the White Orchid. The follow-up here is Tomic, Distinguished Advocate. No lands out of your graveyard, Zan. Yep. <laughs> Don't even think about it. Buddy. Don't even think about playing a land out of your graveyard. We're going back over to Zan now. And all those little chip shots, going from six to four doesn't seem like a huge deal, but one, Purdue is hitting in chunks of two with the stuff that he has. And two, if it starts getting, if Purdue gets to a spot where it starts feeling fuzzy, like Zan's got all this mana up, it, the combat math starts looking bad if he has a handful of lords that he can play at instant speed, just start moving, using your mana on Walking Ballista. At some point, the burden is on Zan to do something about that, so there's no reason for you to do anything risky. Especially at 16, it's not like you're at really much of a risk of uh, end of turn, here's a bunch of lords, untap, kill you, especially now that you have a flying blocker on defense as well. All good points as we head back over to Jameson. Purdue! Makes you wonder if he goes to Purdue. I don't uh, think he does. I don't think there's a relationship. No. He could be the Dean. I love that. If it, again, if it looks unclear if you should attack or not, probably just don't. Because Zan has to do something about the Ballista. And that's really going to clarify his hand once he makes some sort of move. Zan is, is going to cycle, excuse me, an irrigated farmland. A little cycle land there from the Amon Ket block. Here comes your follow-up. Declaration in stone. He found an answer. Well, in response, let's activate the walking ballista. And it looks like two damage is going upstairs. Yeah, I mean, Zan's very close to tapped out. Now, he still has a rattle change of the mana up, so there could be a flash creature. But, ooh. Well, last card is Mutavault. It's a good last one to have. I think that was another copy of Baffling End that was drawn. Here is Anafenza, gain a life. And if you're going to cast Baffling End, what are you going to target? The biggest lord. It's probably the eagle then. The eagle. Yeah, that's 2-3. Currently a 3-4 because of Supreme Phantom. 
That makes some sense. I mean, I'm not waiting on it because uh, a rattle change off the top would be catastrophic. Baffling at number four, going to take care of the Eagle. And now we wait. Keep in mind, Supreme well, Phantom a 1-3. Rattle Chain's a 3-2, and Mutavault secretly a 3-3. Three, three. The attacks here are rancid. Just wait a turn. <laughs> right? It's always good to take a look. I mean, you have three attackers against three blockers, one of which is a 3-3. Three, three. The other, I mean, there's no... Now, what could happen for Zan is perhaps Jameson does not realize the Mutavault is a 3-3, three, three, but Jameson, he took a look, and he said, you know what, I'm going to wait. Per Patrick's instruction, Zan draws a card. Don't have a great look at what it is. If it's a land, this game is basically over. But not really, because then Purdue would have to make what appears to be a pretty tough attack. And also, the the burden is just you know, in, in a spot like this, the thing you'd be most worried about a spirit stack, the thing that might compel you to act ahead of schedule, collected company, sure. not an issue here. Well, here is Heliod, Sun Crown, pre combat, the big fella. It's going to trigger Daxos. It's in there. I would still wait a turn here, I yeah. think. Well, uh, you basically put Zan into a position where he has to draw two cards in a row instead of just one. Because if he has a trick, if he's drawn especially uh, Brazen Borrower, mm -hmm. you lose a ton in combat, and then you're not in a position to attack the next turn. If you wait, now he has to have drawn two things, because you have five lethals versus his three blockers. Well, we get some counters. Although, I guess if you're doing the counters thing, that does change it quite a bit because now the, the, it's much less scary to attack. And Jameson Purdue felt like it was clear enough to come into the red zone, and he was correct. Going to win this match here over Zan Saeed. Two games to one. Mono White Devotion going to take care of Azoria Spirits. And for Jameson Purdue, no relation to Purdue University, it appears. He's a winner winner. He moves on to 11 and 2. Boiler up, my friend. As we come back to the booth, Cedric Phillips, Patrick Sullivan, round number 13, about halfway through because we got to get ready for a time-shifted match here in the Indianapolis Convention Center. So we are going to take a short break, but when we do come back in just three minutes, more Pioneer on the way. See you soon. After three days of STG Tour 